Welcome to the Jones Eng Edmonds Engineering Rocks podcast. I am Ken Bogle, Managing Director of our Civil Environmental Department at Jones Edmonds and Associates and the host of today's show. You know, each month our, our podcast will bring to you exciting guests and topics related to engineering. And as my guests and I talk, you know, please feel free to send in a question uh, through the through the chat function and uh, we'll try to get those answered uh, right away you know make sure you put in your name so we could address you specifically and we'll also try to leave some time at the beginning my guest today is steve laups professor of practice at the department of environmental engineering services engineering sciences at the university of florida he's been there for the past three or four years prior to that he was with jones edmonds for 31 years he's still very much involved with our projects in solid waste as well as numerous projects over at NASA at Kennedy Space Center. Steve has both his bachelor's and his master's at this, in civil engineering from University of Florida. Steve, thanks for being here with us today. Sure. You know, really before we, you know, before we start jumping into the topic of the day, you know, I really wanted to stroll down memory lane with you, Steve, <laughs> and uh, a little bit of a surprise for you. So I'm gonna share my screen real quick. I can't wait. Oh, yeah, I've seen <laughs> just a few pictures of Steve throughout the years. Steve used to be a softball slugger. <laughs> I think I was the worst when, guy on the softball when, team. Many years ago. I also had the pleasure of benching him a few times as the captain of the softball team. Yeah, you did. Wow, look at that. I've never seen that picture. Yeah. We all had fun dunking Steve in the dunk tank at one of our company picnics. That was always fun. It's a good looking guy right there. And then Steve and I went on the uh, a golf tour. So we, we played a lot of golf together. Here we are in the Ocala Open. I think we did fantastic that day. Yeah. And then uh, this was a couple of years ago. We played at the University of Florida Engineering Society golf tournament. So we, we, we stayed on that golf tour. Steve was also, is also a runner, great runner. <laughs> that was fun. Look at Jody. There he is. Photo of our administrative assistant, Steve. Love you. Checking out a truck, uh, doing some debris management. So. Oh, yeah, the hurricane. Just, just having a little fun, Steve. Just kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like with you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, times changed a lot of stuff. Well, Steve, you have a great perspective. You have a great perspective having worked in you know the private consulting world for so many years, you know, past 30 years, and now you're back in academia, you know, for the past three or four years. You know, Jones Edmonds, you were you were a great mentor to you know people like me when I first came in, and to many other engineers when they first started out. Uh, you know, we learned so much from you uh, when you joined Jones Edmonds. You know, especially how to get to meetings on time. You know, that was one of my biggest lessons I learned from you. Uh, get get to meetings on time. <laughs> you didn't learn that from me. I can. And tell now you. that you're a professor at the University of Florida, you know, you have a great opportunity to prepare new college engineering students you know, and get them ready for the job, job market, whether it's, you know, private consulting in municipal government, you know, regulatory agencies. So really that's what we wanted to focus on today is, you know, the students and how we can prepare them, you know, for uh, the job market. So, you know, let's, let's, the state, let's set the stage a little bit. You know, when did you realize you wanted to become an engineer? Um, well, you know, it's funny, when I came to the University of Florida back in 1978, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I, I kind of was leaning towards the business major. I thought that I, I, I was going to go into that. And then I thought maybe I'd like to be a landscape architect. You know, I didn't really know. Um, uh, but I think uh, from a young age, I always had a natural curiosity about how things work, took a lot of stuff apart, wasn't always able to put it back together again. But you know, just enjoyed understanding how things work, used to like to draw, uh, did quite a bit of that. And, um, you know, just like a lot of engineers, I think this is the same story that a lot of engineers will tell. And then, I, you know, as I started taking courses in high school and then in college, I kind of gravitated towards the math and the science classes and, 
when, when I was at UF or in high school, took physics and I liked that. And then at UF, as I took physics, I was kind of hooked. And then I think once I took the basic engineering mechanics courses, um, that's when I knew I wanted to be an engineer. And then at, after that point, it was kind of just up to, you know, I, I thought initially I wanted to be a mechanical engineer, or no, excuse me, an environmental engineer. Um, and then I, I thought, well, I'd, I'd like to be a, mechan a mechanical engineer. And, and then uh, I started thinking about civil, started learning about what the different folks do, started working in construction um, pretty much throughout my college career and in the mining industry. And pretty much that kind of caused me to settle in on civil engineering. So as you were in school and learning about, you know, which discipline you really want to head to, you know, how did you know, or how did you decide that, you know, the consulting path was for you over other types of uh, jobs that were out there? Yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting, you know, because a lot of students ask that same question. We talk, you know, get a lot of students coming with the same kind of questions I had, you know, what do you want to do? Why do you, you know, go in civil engineering or, or do you want to go work for an owner somewhere? Or do you want to go work for, for, uh, you know, an engineering firm or go work for a construction firm. And I don't think I really had a clue. I was, uh, I was, I'd gotten into my master's program just because it made sense. I think at the time to, to get in the master's program and I was just kind of introduced to it. Um, really from, uh, Dr. Christensen, who was a professor of mine introduced me to Bob Edmonds and, and I was, I was initially thinking maybe going to the, um, um, Corps of Engineers. I was I was um, actively thinking of doing that, and then they kind of introduced me to consulting, and it looked interesting. Uh, talk. They started talking to other consulting firms, and and I thought it was interesting because of the variety, the, all the different things you would get, and so that's that's uh, that's kind of how I wound up being. I remember one the one funny thing. Getting back to your other question. It came down to where it was almost a coin flip between mechanical and, and civil engineering. And I went to see this guy named Dr. Spangler, who was in the, ran the department back then. And I asked him the question. He said, well, I'm, I'm actually both. He had a mechanical and a civil. And he just said, you need to be a civil engineer. And I said, <laughs> that kind of tipped me over the edge without much analysis. Steve, you're cutting in and out a little bit. Oh, am I? Yeah. Oh, okay. Did you hear what I said or? No, repeat, repeat that last thing. Well, it was, no, I think getting, I guess, well, the last thing we were talking about, I was just talking about how I had become a civil engineer. I was kind of came down to mechanical versus civil. And it was just a discussion with the department chairman kind of helped me through that. But, you know, getting back to your other question, you know, how do you, you know, working with students, that are trying to figure out what area to go into, that's probably the big burning question. It's a question I started to have and it's a question they have and, and I try to help them through the courses. Um, that course I teach, uh, one of the courses I teach is civil engineering practice. And I think the, the, uh, the important, I think the thing that helps the most with that course is teaching them some of the basic things you need to know as, a, as an engineer, a civil or an environmental engineer, whether you went to work for a consulting firm or if you went to work for the owner or if you went to work for a constructor. You know, we teach about you know, basic contracts, construct or construction delivery methods and contracts, how to interpret drawings, how to do a cost estimate, how to do a schedule, um, and then talk a lot about their behavior and what, how they would uh, perform in the engineering environment, but we talk a lot about the the three parties that are involved in any project. You got the owner, the constructor, and the con and the uh, the design professional. And so we get we talk a lot about the different roles that those three parties play. And I think it helps them to just in that decision making process in what they want to do. You know, Ken, I think your screen has frozen up now. Hey there. Sorry. Yeah, I'm here. I don't know. Having some internet issues today. <laughs> yep. So as you were in the consulting world for so many years, what made you decide to get back into academia world? Um, well, you know, you and I had discussions about this several years ago. I, I think that 
Jones Edmonds, we always had a culture of, of working uh, with, with young students, being in Gainesville, uh, all the work that we've done with the University of Florida, a lot of people in the organization are from the University of Florida. And so we have a lot of interaction with interns and, and uh, young engineers coming out of school and starting their careers. And I think one of the things that I found most rewarding at Jones Edmonds, the thing that I really enjoyed doing was working with young engineers to work with owners to solve problems. And, and um, just watching, you know, watching, you know, you, it's, it's uh, exciting when you help a young engineer or an aspiring engineer, you, you show them the ropes a little bit and then you get to expose them to that environment and kind of mentor them as they try to solve problems. And it's fun to watch them just trying to solve problems. And they'll come back and you'll discuss uh, approaches or things they need to look at. And it's, it's like coaching. And, and, and the one thing I think that we always did good was, was uh, empowering these folks, these younger kids to, to take on more responsibility and to watch them like for the first time take responsibility for something that that is meaningful and you see the excitement that they have for it is something that I've always enjoyed a lot and so uh, I started I think about 20 years in you know I was there 32 years about 20 years in I started thinking you know what do I want to do when I'm done doing this you know like second half career kind of thing and and this is kind of the thing I started thinking about I would like to to work more with young, young uh, engineers or aspiring engineers. And, and then I also, I enjoy that, you know, I've always you know, had neighbors and friends and associates that we have that, that um, are professors at the university. And I've always been a little bit envious of their lifestyle. I think that, um, you know, they, they, they it's, a, it's a very, um, very unique, very collegial environment. Um, and I enjoy that as well. And so then I think the, just the relationship with all the different experts out there and, uh, and involving young people in that is something that I find very, uh, very uh, rewarding. And so, so I kind of set my goal that eventually that's what I would like to do. And so I, you remember I taught back in 2007 when uh, Dr. Townsend went on sabbatical. I taught that oh. class with him. That gave me a taste of what it would be like to teach a college course. Um, helping him, you know, when he needed guest lectures. And then uh, that, you know, and then eventually, as I started thinking about retirement, um, started getting a little more serious about moving in that direction. So let's start talking a little bit about, you know, the students issues and not issues, but the things that affect them, you know, the Florida legislature, you know, over the past few years, at least, you know, trying to limit the number of credit hours, you know, that, uh, that you can get for an undergrad degree and almost penalizing students for taking too many classes at this point you know so how do you how do you think that affects their ability to be ready for the job you know once they graduate yeah i mean that's a that's a real thing i mean it's it's kind of interesting that when i was a student it was a four-year program but it almost took five years to do it to get through with a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and there was all this talk about extending it out and making it a full five-year program so the 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 direction Back in 1983, uh, everybody thought we were going to be expanding the curriculum, and then here we are because of you know real budget issues and the legislature subsidizing a lot of things that that they were they're they're pushed to shrink the curriculum, and so it's been it's been you know shrunk pretty good in some areas. I know. So when, when they I do think it's unfortunate. What's that? I was going to say, well, now that they're shrinking it, what classes are they getting? What classes are they losing out on? Well, I think that um, I think there's less um, electives. You know, they're covering a lot of the same basic things. But then some of the other courses, like there was a required course in construction management that's no longer required. They used to require surveying. That's no longer required. Um, I'm not sure of all the other things that they've cut. Um, but if you were going into, let's say, geotechnical engineering, you almost certainly would take, you know, the two basic, you know, the soils and the geotechnical engineering course, and then you'd probably take advanced geotechnical engineering or something like that as an elective potentially. And so you're getting a little less of that. And so it's just more of a broader overview. 
And yeah, I think it, it doesn't, it's not good. Um, I think that pretty much, you know, the thing I've noticed is that if, if you were serious about becoming a geotechnical engineer, for example, you, you probably couldn't really do it with just a bachelor's degree in, in engineering because you'd be taking two geotech, you know, soils in a geotech course and that's it. And so you would almost certainly want to get a master's degree for, for you know, in that, in the, from that perspective. And, and I think a lot of people would agree with that. You talk to employers, you talk with some of the professors, the geotechnical engineering professors, and they would all agree you probably need to get a master's degree. Um, that might have been true before, but it's more true now for sure. And so I think it does kind of push, you know, they've developed this, this 4-1 program at the university, which is basically trying to close the gap on that, where you can take another year of coursework and, and get a master's degree. It's a, it's a non, um, non um, dissertation or non thesis degree, but they have that too. And so those are the kind of ways that they're making up for it. But yeah, I think it's, it's not good. I think it would be much better to have students to take, they've got to have those core basic courses. So Steve, we know there are some important skills all engineers need, you know, whether whether you're in, you know, out in the job market, whether you're out in consulting world or you know, municipalities or even in academia, yeah, there are certain skills you, you need to have, you know, coming out of college, you know, right. what do you think of those mo most important skills and, uh, you know, what would surprise, what do you think would surprise some people? Yeah, I think that, that um, from a skill standpoint, you know, you, you, you know, you, you obviously have to have your, you know, learn the fundamental uh, engineering skills. The theory uh, is, is obviously critically important. I think that, you know, I think about my entire career, you know, I used to hear people say, you know, I didn't use anything that I learned in college, but I think I used every single thing I learned in, in the engineering program to one extent or another, because whether you're, you know, if you're going to be specializing in a particular area, if you get into project management or you should take on broader responsibilities, you need to have a basic understanding of all the, va the various aspects of your profession. And so, you know, your technical skills, uh, just being proficient in those areas, understanding the theory as you're a student, and then anytime you're exposed to it in work, continue to develop your understanding and your ability to, to, uh, to try to apply. And it's always a struggle. How do I apply this stuff that I've learned in the real world? But one of the things we talk a lot about in the civil practice course, and I have a lot of discussions with students about it, done a little bit of research on this since I've been here, is that, and, and I, um, is the soft skills. And there's a lot of talk about that. I just had, a, we had a guest lecturer come talk to our other class that uh, in the construction, he's a construction uh, project manager for a, for a big construction firm here in Florida was talking about, you know, the, the ability to communicate, the ability to empathize, to, to uh, have control of your emotions, to understand other people's emotions and what motivate them uh, are incredibly important. And so we, we had, I had presented, I had a little, we had a whole uh, module kind of on this. It's all, it started out as the ability to communicate, talk about written communication, talk about oral communication, you know, speaking in a group. Um, but that critical, the other things uh, are even more important that, 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 uh, I, I guess you'd call it like uh, emotional intelligence, you know, continuing to develop that so that you can relate with people, understand, because you're dealing in teams, you're dealing with lots of people. And then on any projects like the projects we deal with, uh, they affect the public, they affect other, you know, companies, they affect a lot of different people. So you wind up having a lot of stakeholders. And so understanding what's going on with them, being able to communicate effectively, being able to listen, being able to then um, use that in your work is, is an extremely important tool. And so there's these studies out there that have shown that, that um, you know, they talk about hard skills, you know, the, the, the craft that you have versus the soft skills and how much do they contribute to long-term success. And uh, the several papers that I read as part of putting together this lecture, and uh, it's like 85%. You know, some might say 75, some might, might say 90, and, you know, somehow there's, that was scientifically derived by somebody that studies those things, but um, I pretty much agree, and that doesn't take away from the hard skills, because that's a minimum requirement, but the soft skills for your long-term career success, coming out of school, focusing on a good career, you have to have 
those soft skills are what are going to make or break your, your, your career or are going to control the degree to which you will advance in your career. Yep, I totally agree. You know, this past month in the Florida Engineering Society um, monthly journal, uh, I was the, I happened to be the, the champion of it and it was, it was um, focused on workplace trends and a couple of those articles deal with exactly what you're talking about, emotional intelligence, you know, and working with others. And so that's, we felt it was such an important topic. You know, we, we talk about it a lot at Jones Edmonds, you know, as a key, key way of learning, key way of working with people. And it's something everyone needs to have. And you're right, we don't learn a lot about that in colleges. And we're, you know, we're all hopeful that, you know, that will become more of a, a commonplace that you focus in on those kind of skills. I think it is. I think at least we're, you know, we're doing it. Um, I'm doing it. And I know other, other um, people talk about it as well. And so it's, it's uh, you know, I look at these students and I'm amazed, you know, that at the University of Florida, there's a lot of very bright kids there going to school. And there's, uh, they are, uh, and, and a, for the most part, a pretty, you know, they're all different ages, different points in their lives, but a pretty, pretty decent level of maturity too. And so I'm impressed. And I think if we continue to coach them and push them towards, you know, developing these skills, then, uh, you know, we're really putting out a good product for industry to get in uh, as they get out. I know a couple of the other skills I always mention to, you know, graduating seniors, that's the one who we talk to the most because we're interviewing them, but, you know, presenting skills and writing skills, two critically important things. That, again, I don't know that we spend that much time of it. I mean, you know, back in, when I was in school, we didn't spend a lot of time on it. I know professors are spending, you're providing more opportunity to be able to write and present now than we did in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can tell you that, uh, you know, I had, when I came to Jones Edmonds and I'd written, you know, by then I'd written a thesis and uh, with, with a professor and that's, that's a big help. And I thought I was okay. And I, I wrote this report and I gave it to Dick Jones and his comment was, you know, you, you, uh, I can't say it the way he said it, but he said, you don't write very good, you know, and he, he uh, said, you need to keep working on it. And then, and then being exposed to Bob Edmonds, you know, it seems like, and you, you had the same thing where you would write something and then Bob would, would redline it right there. And uh, just having somebody that it just takes repetition. And I'd say for the most part, uh, the vast majority of students don't write very well. And uh, when they're coming out of school and, uh, but there, there are some that are excellent, you know, some just amazing. Uh, but for the most part, I'd say that's a major thing. And it's a, it's a learned skill and it requires mentoring and tutoring. And it really what it boils down to is, you know, you, they sit down when they're in college, you know, that's the advantage of getting a master's degree. You get another year of writing under the tutelage of somebody that writes well, at least hopefully a professor that writes well. And so that's another year of just being able to write well. And so then, but then when they go to work and you, you, um, you know, you sit down and you talk with the people you're working with, you, 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 you know, you establish an outline for whatever it is, you're preparing a technical report. Um, and then you start writing and you learn those writing skills. But then every time you write a draft, you have somebody that, that, that does it well, that edits that and gets it back to you. And gradually you, you learn to write well. And right. that's, that's about the only way I've ever found to, to improve somebody's writing. Yep. And it's the same thing with presenting. It is about all about practice. Uh, that's, there's, there's no substitute for it. It's, it's all about practice. And you're right. Writing is the same way. Yeah. That civil practice class, you know, all the design classes I make the students, they, they have to write technical memos. I usually give them examples of some Jones Edmonds memos and say, this is the format. Uh, you know, you always need to wrap up anything that any work product you do with a technical memo that provides context and then provides the information in a way that somebody can review it and recreate what you did. And, and I make them write those. Every deliverable has to be in that format. And, and, they, and then I, I check their writing. I, I, you know, if it's not written well, it, it affects their grade. And then I also review it. And then with the presenting, they have to present their product. In the civil practice class, that usually has between 70 and 90 students in it. And so it's a great opportunity to, you know, for, for you know, most of us in presenting, the, the biggest challenge is really the, the kind of the, the, the nervousness from getting up and talking in front of a lot of people. That was always my thing. And so once you get up and do that a few times and, and you understand the basic, you know, how to outline what you're going to present and some of the basic, you know, tools looking at the audience and, and things like that, 
it's just getting up and doing it. So it's a great opportunity. So every one of those students has to get up in front of 90 of their peers and present. And so it, it, it's amazing. It's, it's fun to watch, you know, they're all nervous, you know, and then they, uh, but they get out and they get it done. And, and I think it's a big step for them. Definitely. So let's jump into what, what do you think industry can do better to support students that are, you know, coming out of college and getting ready for the job market? I think that there's, you know, industry does a decent job right now. They're, uh, you know, they have the, the, the various, um, you know, the, the uh, fairs, job fairs and things like that. They, uh, you know, industry, Jones Edmonds certainly provides a lot of support uh, through uh, different sponsorships and things like that. Other engineering firms uh, do the same thing. And so I think any, any opportunity, you know, students crave interaction with the industry they want to work in. And so they talk a lot about internships. They talk a lot about where they want to work. And uh, any interaction, any chance to get them working, uh, you know, students working with you, um, scholarships, obviously, you know, financial is always great. But I think more than anything is just exposing them to the real world because, you know, what they're doing from the beginning, you know, a lot of engineers, you know, you're trying to, you learn these basic things in school theory and, and things like that. But then particularly in civil engineering, it's not a real clean um, they're, you know, like JITEC and some of these things. And so there's this struggle to reconcile what the theory is with the practical, the practical situation you're in in the field. And so any opportunity where they can get in the field or to work with a practicing engineer on how you would interpret what you see and apply your theory is something that would help that that makes their education just that much better. And so any, any interaction whatsoever, you know, internships, or even uh, you know things where you can get them involved in a specific project. Um, oh yeah, I think I think in internships are, are definitely the way to go. It definitely you know gets the students out there and and get a feel for you know what's going to be in the future, and they may may not like it, and then you know it gives them an opportunity to decide what they're going to like when they get out of school. Yep, I've had that happen. Yeah. You know, I also think you know getting involved with uh, you know some of, like you're saying, get involved with. Uh, professionals, you know, so through like Florida Engineering Society, you know, American Society of Civil Engineers, you know, that's a way to interact with, um, with, with the professionals that are out there, uh, especially in the state of Florida. You know, I know both those organizations are, you know, big with students, um, you know, having the conferences together when we have conferences, and then also, you know, also the different meetings that we have. So it's a great opportunity. Yeah, you know, that's one thing that um, I don't push it enough, but the student don't need to really the students the student body at UF particularly environmental engineering sciences but also civil are very good at um, you know they're very active in their their societies and they're you know they, they, like the ASCE has the you know they they tend to do you know super good in the concrete canoe and the bridge con competitions and all the various things they've hosted the uh, the the ASCE meetings and then and then there's just so many groups over in EES and there. So it's a very much different than when I was a student, you know, it's much more cohesive um, groups that are much more active in the professional student chapters of the professional societies than, than anything I ever saw as a student. And so, yeah, that's probably a big thing is the, and you know, they, those student chapters interact with professionals. So you, you, that's a great point. That's another area where engineering firms, you know, or firms in general, anybody out there would do well to, to um, it does two things. One is it helps the students a lot. And then it also exposes students to the various organizations that are looking for, to hire people eventually and get to meet them. So is there anything, you know, government agencies, academia and the industry, you know, the three prongs kind of there that, you know, that we can work, how we can work best together to, to prepare these, you know, college students for the, for the job market. Yeah, I'd say that, um, that the, the thing, the thing that I think has been, you know, all the things we've talked about are valuable, right? The, the internships and the, the participation in the professional student chapters of the professional societies, those are great opportunities for interaction. Um, the, like I said, the scholarships, the, the, the um, internships, all those things are, are important. 
The other thing, and it's something Tim Townsend really well, is that um, the the various owners, you know, the counties, uh, private companies, um, the state, uh, just all these different organizations that have engineering responsibilities um, will sponsor research sometimes that, that winds up getting a relatively small amount of money that, that gets the researchers involved in maybe solving a, or, or evaluating or solving a particular problem. Um, and it does two things. One, it helps to advance the you know the state of the art a little bit because you might be doing something that you wouldn't be looking at you know something that's a little bit out there maybe but it also gets students because what we do is when we get those projects we have uh, graduate students you know some PhDs some master's students I think Tim has about 30 students if you added them all up including the undergrads we employ a lot of undergraduates just OPS you know you out and you hire them for particular projects and you have these groups of students working, uh, and so and so they're exposed to the the various engineering firms and to the owners, you know, the various uh, county governments. Let's say, for example, working on projects, and so they're getting to interact in that environment on something that's very interesting and that's able to solve a problem. And so uh, it enhances. It has an and it, and it, it also requires them to to write more. We make them get up and present things. Um, and so that really is an incredible enhancement to their education. And now, so now, huge now I know the, uh, you know, the school, they have, uh, you know, it's better, they have quarterly meetings with industry to, to, to review curriculum and things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, isn't, doesn't that provide another method to, you know, to work together to try to create a, you know, the, the student of the future kind of thing? Yeah, evening with industry, those those types of things that they have. No, I, I mean like uh, the, the um, it's it's almost like the board meeting that um, where they where the industry comes and meets with the you know the um, universities deans and the you know the professors and you, you're evaluating you know what's going on in the in the. In oh, like the external advisory board. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean participation in that. I know that uh, I think Rick is on that. Um, it's a it's a big benefit too. I know that that um, you know I felt I was involved in that at one point, and I felt like it was I felt like it was good to provide input, and they and the university seemed to be looking for that input. And now that I'm on this side and I've been to a couple of those meetings, um, I like to hear it. I mean, you you want you always want to hear what it is the people that are going to employ the students you're putting out. You know, what is it they need? It's always kind of interesting because they're always wanting. Um, yeah, you want everything, right? You're, you're saying, what do you want a, a entry level engineer to be equipped with when they show up at your door? And um, you know, the, you, the one of the common things you'll hear is, I want them to be familiar with you know various you know software packages for various things. And you, you know, the thing you got to remind them is that you know, heck, they're cutting back the number of hours. Right. And so we need to focus number one on their core, you know, their core class, making sure that. Uh, they're taking their water and wastewater classes and that they're, they're geotechnical and they're structural and, and, and all the various, you know, air pollution classes, all the different things that they have to take that they got that. And then after that, all the other stuff uh, would be nice. But, you know, I don't, um, for the most part, you get a lot of good, um, a good input, I think. Awesome. Awesome. All right, Steve, we got to start wrapping up, but okay, I'm going to finish it up with this, you know, to take you back to your softball days, bottom and ninth. Three on, two outs. You're up at the plate. You hope this hope this is not bringing back any bad memories, but it is. <laughs> here comes a big fat softball question for you. Who wins Florida Georgia this weekend? Oh, Florida. There you go. Yep. You heard it here. Never, never, not a doubt. <laughs> that a guarantee. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's podcast, especially Steve Louts. Thank you. Great input. Great input to students. Great in input for the industry. Uh, really appreciate it. You know, if anyone has any more questions or any questions, they'd like to email me at kvogel at jonesedmonds.com. I'd be glad to answer them or try to get those questions to Steve. He'd be glad to answer them as well. Uh, I, again, I'm Ken Vogel. Uh, this has been a Jones Edmonds Engineering Rocks podcast. Keep an eye out for our next podcast in early December.
Thanks. Thank you again, Steve. Appreciate you being here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, we'll see you. Thanks. Bye.